So even though we are six feet from each other, <laughs> we need to use the mic so that we can get a good uh, recording in case we can provide any information that might help uh, others who aren't able to be here today. So um, I think you know Dr. Terry Smith, um, University of Michigan, formerly at UCLA. Uh, you might know of a, um, a medicine for an autoimmune disease of the eyes that's called Tepeza, T. protumumab. He is the guy who invented and developed it and it's now been approved and it's helping a bunch of people with Graves' disease of thyroid eye disease. Um, we've been working together with Dr. Uh, Terry Blaschke, another advisor for uh, 14 years, basically. Um, what we want to do today is just give you the opportunity to ask questions about things that you've been wondering about with respect to the science behind the disease or the therapies or what's to come, tolerization or otherwise. Um, Terry, do you want to make a couple introductory comments? Uh, yeah, delighted to see all of you at the conference. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I know I know that it's a schlep for everyone, um, but um, trust that that you are enjoying it and and getting as much out of it as we are. Um, uh, it's an exciting time in medical science uh, as the rate of discovery accelerates and this translates into far better means of diagnosis and therapy and certainly in in the space of NMO um, uh, this could not be more more true so I think we're just entering a new, a new era where therapies are being approved, becoming accessible based on uh, greater understanding of disease mechanism, um, whereas previously, most of the medications that we had in our armamentarium were, were predicated, their use predicated on uh, uh, trial and error. Um, the old um, throw enough pasta strands against the wall, uh, a few will stick. But we, as we get smarter, um, we don't have to resort to that sort of lengthy and uh, uh, ineffective means for developing uh, drugs that work and are well, relatively well tolerated. So those of us who think a lot about NMO um, over the last two, three years have obviously been overjoyed with, with the approval of, of the three drugs. They work in very different ways, uh, but the common theme is that they target in very specific ways key elements of something we call the immune response. That is the response of the professional immune system to molecules, cells that, that are perceived as being foreign. And the immune system is is what keeps us safe. Um, and by safe, what I mean is 
infection-free, cancer-free, and uh, the, the ability to repair the body. mainly focused on, you know, things are of greatest priority to you. Uh, so why don't we just take some questions? And uh, Jesus, I know you were talking about colonization. Um, So let's talk about cures. That's really what we're talking about. Um, And it's a bold idea. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it might happen sooner than any of us think. Can we just quickly, buddy, we're just going to go quickly over what we call the immune system university. Okay? Most of your immune cells are made in the bones in your hip region and your upper femur. That's where most of your T cells and B cells come from. It's the bone marrow. That's where most of the bone marrow is. It's obviously in every bone, but a lot of it comes from this part of your body. There is a system called the lymphatic system. It's very similar to the circulatory system for blood, but here's the beautiful, mysterious part about the immune system that relates to NMO and MOGAD, but it also provides opportunities for cures. And this is really where we get to tolerization. The two primary lymphoid organs are the spleen and the thymus. The thymus wraps around your esophagus. It begins about the size of your fist Sorry, it it begins smaller. It grows to about the size of your fist, maybe a little smaller than that by the time you're 20, 25. And then the rest of your life, it shrinks back down almost to nothing. Why do we care about the spleen and the thymus? It's because the T cells and the B cells that come from bone marrow have to be tested. They're tested in two ways. First, can they recognize something? Can they recognize an antigen? And second, can they tell the difference between a good antigen and a bad antigen? The second question is the question of tolerance. Okay, when people have NMO, (coughs) NMOSD, or MOGAD, they have lost tolerance to aquaporin-4 or MOG. Buddy, before we go go down that road, does everyone in the room have at least a a, a sense of what an antigen is? Um, An antigen is something that that attracts an antibody. Um, And antibodies are are made by B cells. Um, but, But... the important thing here is that is that um, our body is composed of billions of antigens, whether they're proteins or sugars or fats or a combination thereof. And it's as Dr. Yeaman is is explaining, uh, it's it's the immune system that that tries to distinguish. Um, foreign from from self, and uh, do you want to take it from there? Thank you. So we're being a little bit general here, but in in a simple term, when immune cells go from the bone marrow to the spleen, that's where B cells are given these two tests. When cells that are T cells go to the thymus, that's when T cells are given these two tests. And again, the tests are, can you react to something, an antigen, and can you tell the difference between good and bad antigen? 99% 
of the T and B cells that leave your bone marrow do not pass those two tests. Only 1% that leave the bone marrow and go to the spleen or the thymus are approved. They pass those two exams. And that sounds like, hey, well, only 1%. How could we possibly be alive, you know? Well, our bone marrow makes a lot of these cells. So 1% of, you know, 25 trillion is a pretty big number. This axis of bone marrow checked by thymus, checked by spleen, is called central tolerance. Central tolerance. It turns out that if these cells get approved, they pass the exams, most of them go to the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes you have under your chin, <coughs> under your arm, in your groin, elsewhere. That's the lymphatic system. That's where your T cells and B cells go to reside. Now, many of them circulate in the bloodstream also. But for example, last time you got a cold or COVID or whatever, you probably had swelling of your lymph nodes, right? And it was tender and it's like, ugh. What happens is in the periphery, and now we're talking about you know, the rest of the body here, um, these cells make their way into various tissues. T and B cells get into your brain and into your optic nerve and into every other tissue you have to perform something called surveillance. They're looking, they're saying, is this supposed to be here? Is that supposed to be here? They're just looking around and they're talking to a kind of cell that is called a dendritic cell or an antigen presenting cell. And it's only when an antigen presenting cell, which might be you know, a cell that is sometimes you know, drawn as having multiple arms because it feels like it's always reaching out and figuring things out. If an antigen presenting cell interacts with a T cell in a way that both of them recognize the same antigen, like a piece of aquaporin-4 or a piece of mod protein, the T cell can become activated. So now the T cell being told by the dendritic cell that this is an antigen that you should look out for and do something about. Now this T cell says, okay, we got to do something about this. And that's when the T cell becomes activated. So now it is an antigen reactive T cell. If this cell makes a mistake and thinks aquaporin-4 is foreign, this T cell is going to think aquaporin-4 is foreign. Okay, let me stop there and, and Terry can, can take it from here because now what we're gonna talk about is once a B cell or a T cell is activated to think that aquaporin-4 or MOG is foreign, that is broken tolerance. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about how we turn the clock back and restore tolerance. Terry. Yeah, so, so as Dr. Yeaman is suggesting, um, there is a built-in inefficiency in the process. And there are multiple stages in which immune activation, like an activated T cell or an antigen-specific B cell activated, uh, can be called back to stand down. And a, a lot of that has to do with uh, a process which we call um, uh, uh, checkpoint uh, and checkpoint gating um, where a there's a stringency that's applied to allowing activated T cells and activated B cells first of all to cross talk to, to, ex to exchange molecular information B cells to T cells, T cells to B cells, and both of those cells to other cells 
which broadly we'll, we'll call antigen presenting cells. Some of them are dendritic cells. Um, they're all part of the monocyte family of white cells. Anyway, um, there we are now beginning to understand how to tame all of the mischievous immune activation um, and to, in essence, restore tolerance. And as Dr. Yeaman will begin to discuss, there, there are a number of techniques that have been developed over the last decade which look promising in terms of being able to tame the immune response and thus to restore immune tolerance. How many of you have had a tetanus vaccine in your lives? Most of us, right? Why do we have to get those every five or so years? Torture. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that the immune system has a memory, but it doesn't remember forever. And I mentioned that as an example because what we're really talking about with tolerization is bringing technology in that tells the, the, the B and T cells coming into the central tolerance pathway to ignore aquaporin-4 or ignore MOG. You can say, how possibly could we do that? And why would that help us if we already have disease? Well, T and B cells do not live forever in most cases, and so those will wane. What we want is the new ones that come in to not think of aquaporin-4 or MOG as foreign, okay? The technologies that we are using interact between the dendritic cell or the antigen-presenting cell and T cell or the antigen presenting cell and B cell. By the way, B cells are interesting because they can be both the antibody producing cell, but we've learned a lot since, since 2008, and B cells can also be an antigen presenting cell. So you've got two ways of activating T cells to become autoreactive. If we can use meds that inhibit B cells, and there's already some of those, that's fine. We can temporarily turn off B cell um, intolerance. But if we really want to cure, we've got to go back to the source. And we heard earlier today examples of bone marrow transplant. Why would we talk about bone marrow transplant in NMO? Well, that's because that's where your immune system cells come from. In some ways, bone marrow transplant is the ultimate, most radical form of tolerization. We want a much kinder and gentler approach to tolerization. How do we do that? Well, in many points along this axis, we can introduce either engineered pieces of aquaporin-4 or MOG. We can introduce cells that will kill autoreactive T cells if they find them. We can use your own antigen presenting cells that we take out of your body, show them MOG or aquaporin-4 under conditions that they will not become autoreactive. So now they've been educated to not react to these cells and then put them back in you. And then they can go tell the others, hey, you know, don't, don't worry about aquaporin-4, it's fine. Don't worry about MOG, it's fine. Those are called dendritic cell vaccines. Anyways, there's a long list of technologies. I mentioned the, the red blood cell approach where you squeeze, literally, the company is called SQZ, squeeze. Uh, you, you push these antigens, aquaporin-4 or MOG, into red blood cells, and then we let the natural tolerance mechanisms of red blood cells do the rest. There are nanoparticles that contain pieces of MOG or aquaporin-4. There are inverse vaccines. Inverse vaccines, yeah. So 
you know about the COVID vaccines, designed for, to activate the immune system to recognize the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? And by doing so, turn the immune system up to deal with that. Well, you can do the same thing in the opposite. You can precisely say, we want you to recognize this piece of aquaporin-4, but when you do, instead of turning the immune system up, we want you to turn the immune system down. And we do that by modifying the RNA that goes into the particle. That's already been demonstrated for proof of concept. So it's coming, it's not if, like I say, it's just when. Let me stop there and see what kinds of questions you have for, for Terry and I, please. I've been told that I have um, inflammation on my spine that left scar tissue. Um, so if something like this were able to be presented into the body and work, would it be able to work on the damage that's already done or with the damage? I mean, I'm I mean, I would like to think that it would just go away, but I doubt if that's the case. I have a quick answer and then and Dr. Smith will give you the, the longer answer. It's a two-part answer. One is if your lesions are caused by ongoing cells that are attacking your, your tissue, um, if we tolerize, that should go away. But if it's permanent injury, then we're going to need another approach that is regeneration. We have to rebuild the tissue. Terry, do you want to say more about that? Yeah. So, so as da Dr. Yeaman has just said, um, this, is, this is a two-part process. One has to do with the recruitment of immune cells into an area of the body which is either properly or mistakenly recognized as being a trouble spot. And in the, the case of NMO, it's the latter. And th these immune cells, um, certainly among the first ones to arrive, they're the rebel rousers. They're, they're, they're the, 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 those who, who are, you know, uh, ask questions last, uh, uh, aim and fire first. Uh, and that's done because the body is ultimately trying to survive. But, but there are lot, lots of mistakes to that, to, to that uh, uh, style of, of uh, behavior, right? Um, so once, once the immune reaction, the inflammation, has be matured a bit um, and more order has been restored, then there is the opportunity for something called tissue remodeling. And in the case of, of the, the brain, the central nervous system, uh, the peripheral nervous system, um, uh, th there is the, the um, ability to what we call remyelinate. For that myelin sheath, the proteins that are involved and, and all of the complex molecular machinery to turn on, um, some of it uh, might not have been on the on position since we were developing as, as embryos or early in life, but because there's, there's some flexibility in, in the reparative process of, of the body, these, these, uh, uh, the ability to, to reform the myelin sheath, uh, we know can, can be reinvigorated. And ultimately, it's that insulation that will allow uh, for nerve impulses to travel efficiently 
uh, th wherever they need to go between the, the, the brain and the spinal cord, the spinal cord and the peripheral tissues. So um, this is, is going to be a complex set of processes that need to be activated in order to restore to restore your abilities, those that have been lessened by the disease itself. One, one optimistic way of saying all that is, is your body is amazingly resilient. And part of this whole problem is we may not have to solve every part of this process. If we could just turn off loss of tolerance it's possible the body can just take over from there and restore, repair, remine as, as you think. We have just a couple of uh, minutes left, but please go ahead. I'll, I'll try to be cr uh, brief. Thank you so much for this. Um, so I'm 59, <laughs> and uh, all of these um, methods look really hopeful. I, what, are, what are the, can we expect to see something like that? Could I expect to see something in my lifetime as a treatment and, you know, for older or, or any age patient, especially MOG patients, because that's what I have. Um, when do you expect these kinds of things to start rolling out into clinical trials and into, um, into hospital, hospitals or clinics? Have you looked on clinicaltrials.gov lately? Not for this, but I, okay. I will be. <laughs> you'll, you'll look there and you'll find um, at least three clinical trials now that are focused on tolerization in NMO and no death. Point being, it's already happening. In the meantime, there are, like I said, dozens of companies that we have been working with over the last two years, kind of under the radar, to say, hey, you know, it's great that you want to focus on type 1 diabetes or it's great that you want to focus on retolerizing in lupus, but you don't even really know what the autoantibodies or autoantigens are in those diseases. Let's start with one you know what the autoantigen is, like NMO. And they're like, hmm, okay, let's do that. So they've sort of taken their technology and moved it to NMO and MOGAD. I'll give you a great example. BioNTech, you know, the company that's, developed one of the major vaccines for COVID, they turned their attention to MOG. Yeah. They have demonstrated proof of concept in a mouse model of an inverse vaccine that retolerizes to MOG. Amazing. That is amazing. And that's coming to the clinic along with about 10 other things in the next year or two. So to your question, you know, I think I'm an optimist. But I like to think it's going to happen, and you're going to see sort of an explosion in the next five years. Mm. No, I, I, other than uh, to um, state resoundingly that that it it's not just the efforts that that are currently being directed specifically to NMO. We we know that. Nature is a pretty conservative uh, 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 circumstance I in that um, there's very little duplication of effort. And what that means in terms of health and disease is that very similar processes are involved in virtually every disease that you can name. So th this can be a good thing or this can be a very bad thing, but in, in the case of accelerating our understanding of human disease, there are so many shared mechanisms that, that this really helps us gain enormous traction in understanding relatively rare diseases like NMO. And so many of the things in the cancer world or in the infectious disease world um, are greatly amplifying the efforts that are currently being uh, directed to directly toward NMO. 
And I think we're about, we're about out of time. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, maybe we should just end with, you know, just as patients were the answer when it came to the clinical trials that led to the treatments, remember only 450 patients were responsible for three approved drugs that are going to help maybe 450,000 patients, I, I don't know. But patients who enter clinical trials, including those for tolerization, are the heroes that are gonna make this happen. Okay, I think we're about out of time. Sorry, it goes so fast. You're welcome to stay. But uh, thank you so much for the questions and, and being here today. Thank you. Thank you.